ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Charles Duke and guests Jim Amos and Zach Rosenberg. Thank you. Um, I'm enormously pleased to be joined today by um, Zach Rosenberg, who's the CEO of the St. Bernard Project, which is a not-for-profit in New Orleans devoted to rebuilding homes destroyed by Katrina, and Jim Amos, the editor of the um, Times-Picune and NOLA.com, who, and Jim oversaw the coverage of Katrina um, that won the Pulitzer Prize and has actually won two more prizes since then. Around that, around about that time, is over as the papers won two more prizes, uh, two at the time, two at the time, at, and let me start by just quickly asking a question because we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, we're going to be talking about New Orleans and the and the models that it offers for other cities facing similar potential disasters. How many people in this room have been to New Orleans in the last ten years? It's been a decade since Katrina. A number of you. How many people had a great time? <laughs> how many people? Yeah, good. How many people felt like you had fourteen billion dollars worth of a good time? One, that man had a very good time <laughs> in New Orleans. <laughs> That's who I'm going to New Orleans with next time. $14 billion, of course, is what the, um, the federal government ended up paying to help r make sure that the city does not flood again. Let me start with a, a sort of basic question, which is, that's a huge amount of money. It's been 10 years. There's still rebuilding going on, Zach, as, as you and I talked about. There's, there are still problems with the city. Why, at this point, should anyone in this room who does not live in New Orleans care or feel like we should be invested at all in whether New Orleans comes back? Why can't we say after 10 years, look, this is a city that was built in a somewhat unsustainable area. It should not be rebuilt. It, we're going to see another Katrina-like event again. Why shouldn't we say cities come and cities go and New Orleans time has, co has come and gone? Well, first of all, I think that's not who we are as Americans. I don't think we are as Americans folks who stop after an amount of time, we finish the job, and that's an important thing. The second, the, the work is far from over. While there's been tremendous success in New Orleans, the schools are good and getting better. It's a wonderful climate for business. There's about 5,000 American citizens who own homes that they cannot afford to rebuild, so the job is not done. The third, we've got to remember with Katrina in New Orleans, this was a man-made disaster. If the levees were built properly, this isn't a matter of can. This is a matter of will and doing things properly. And if the levees were built properly, New Orleans wouldn't have suffered the damage it did. And I, I want to make one very important point here. New Orleans over the years has become far more vulnerable because of the way the Mississippi River has been modified and because of the shipping channels that have been carved in. So folks in Louisiana who have lived there for generations and generations, now maybe there's some uh, new folks moving to Louisiana, but when they first got there, it was a safer place. If we look at other parts of the country that are more transitory, we look at California, there is an earthquake coming. We all know it. There was a great piece in The New Yorker recently that I think should put all of us at a little bit of fear for what's coming in our country. That's happening, and we have no concern about people moving to California. So it's an awfully slippery slope merely to say that there's a substantial issue and we should stop because there's been a long amount of time. I think in America we finished the job and it's not done. One last point. Folks said it would take 15 to 20 years for New Orleans to recover. If we run 17 miles, that's a long way to run. It's more than I've run in, since Katrina. Um, but we haven't run a marathon. And I think we've got to finish, and that's the right thing to do. If I could have a go at that, Charles? Yeah, sure. absolutely. And, and I, I agree with everything that, that Zach said. Um, but you used the word sustainable. I mean, what, what city in America is not on the edge of non-sustainability, especially if it's a coastal town? Um, New Orleans was a city before the United States was a country, which is true of New York, too, of course. Um, but it was not some crumbling, almost gone place. You know, it was, a, it, it was a place that attracted 10 million tourists a year that was the major gateway for, for grain and oil and gas and um, a major port in the United States, a historic city with an unparalleled 19th century housing stock. Um, what's the alternative to, to not rescuing New Orleans when Katrina happened, as Zach said, as a result of, of a shoddy federal job of engineering um, that could have befallen any city in a similar situation? 
So, so let me ask something. When we were talking on the phone before, um, before you flew out, you had mentioned that you felt like if you looked at folks who have recovered, who've gotten their houses rebuilt, who've done okay, that disproportionately that the line in the sand seems to be there's a bunch of people who know how to deal with bureaucracy. They know how to, they had insurance to begin with. They know how to fill out insurance forms. They know how to call some up an agent and harass them until they get a check in the mail. They know how to be persistent enough to get their kids into the right school, even if they're not districted for it. That what, what we see is we see a, a haves and have nots very starkly in New Orleans. That, that obviously some of that exists on socioeconomic lines, but some of it exists on gumption lines and your comfort with bureaucracy and your ability to fight for what you believe you should have. If we're living in an age, and I think probably most of the people in this room feel that we are, where any one of us, any big city at the, could have a Katrina-like event, perhaps not quite as, as devastating in such a short period of time, but we know, as you mentioned the New Yorker piece, that there's an earthquake coming on the West Coast. We saw with Sandy that it doesn't take much to to make New York um, fall apart at its seams. If we know that, what should we be learning from the experience of New Orleans about how we prepare our population, both the vulnerable and those who have the gumption to recover, with an eye towards the fact that this is gonna happen again in one of our cities? There shouldn't, there shouldn't be the divide to begin with. There shouldn't be the racial divide and the economic divide and the educational divide and the digital divide um, that exists, I'm sure, here as well as in, in, in older American cities like New Orleans. Um, and, and as you say, the gumption divide, I mean, people who just are not in the habit of asserting themselves, um, who've never made a motel reservation outside of New Orleans, who can't bear the thought of, of leaving their pets uh, or the house, um, who, who don't have transportation, all those things are a barrier to, well, to imminent danger at first and then to recovery in the long run. And Charles, I'd, I'd love to answer the question in two ways. First, just to address who is still not home in New Orleans. So when we talk about the gumption divide and we, we talk about folks who might not be comfortable advocating for themselves, I think that's a really great point. If the people in New Orleans were more indignant and demanded that they be treated justly, this recovery would be farther along. But I do want to describe who the folks are. The St. Bernard Project at this point, almost 10 years after the recovery, gets over 15 requests a week from families who own homes. So we think about how we were raised in America and we were taught, work hard, buy a house, and things can only get but so bad if you follow that American dream. So the people who aren't home right now were the people who achieved the American dream and do largely to no fault of their own, still aren't home. So it's, it's not this class of folks who can't survive. These were independent, autonomous folks who were doing reasonably well in America before. In terms of resilience, I can't applaud enough. I don't see Dr. Roden here, but I really don't see anything with this light. Um, the work that she and the folks are at the Rockefeller Foundation are doing is gonna change our country's future by making sure that we're sustainable. I'll tell you briefly what St. Bernard Project's doing. We've launched in partnership with Zurich and Toyota and UPS, what we call Disaster Resilience and Recovery Lab. And so we're focusing on 11 communities a year, small and mid-sized businesses, homeowners and municipalities and working with them to understand and mitigate risk and then measure success based on change behavior. And, and let me ask on that because so so if we try and get the, the gumption, try and get over the gumption divide as best we can before an event comes, both of you have said to me and I've, I've seen this reflect in the press that one of, that it wasn't money alone that rebuilt New Orleans, that there was this genuine kind of coming together of neighborhoods and of communities Jim, you had mentioned to me that you thought that this was actually the critical element beyond dollars. Talk to me a little bit about what do you see when, when a community did rebuild, a neighborhood did rebuild, what was the necessary ingredient besides dollars that we should be cultivating right now in New York or other cities? Well, some of the ingredients I wouldn't wish on anyone. Uh, I mean, the, the, the great commonality of the Katrina experience, um, by that I mean it affected you, whether you lost your house or not, um, whether you were moneyed or poor, um, that brought together an energy, and it's one of, the, one of the silver linings of Katrina, the way in which it fostered leadership in neighborhoods, and I'm sure Zach knows this on a, on a very grassroots level, where people suspected there would never be you know, a neighborhood 
leadership emerging, um, people who are now on the city council who were just uh, obscure uh, neighborhood association officers. Um, so the commonality of the experience had a tremendously energizing effect and gave people a stake in the community that they really never had had before um, and gave them a sense that their individual actions mattered, their collective ones did. Right after Katrina, we sent reporters to some of the great disaster spots of, of the world, um, to Holland, um, the 1952 flood, to Kobe, Japan, um, to parts of the United States. And, and one of the common denominators that our reporters heard over and over from people was that your government will not be the critical deciding element. And to be sure, uh, government is absolutely necessary and you're not gonna rebuild your flood protection system without government. But the grassroots emergence of leadership in places like New Orleans is, is what made the difference. Um, and I, I think you've, you've probably experienced that. Yeah, there, there's a notion of post-traumatic growth. And in the communities where there were some individuals who um, after trauma grew, I think one community Jim's talking about is Broadmoor, where there was a tremendous leader, Latoya Cantrell, who's now one of the best, I think, uh, city council members, who also had the outside support of Harvard University. <laughs> right, and so I think that there's a couple different spheres going on. There's natural uh, local leadership and then outside intervention that invests not just dollars but cents that goes a long way. One of the best ways to hasten recovery is to prevent contractor fraud. So where we are right now, over 80% of the people seeking our help are suffering contractor fraud. Of course, the best way to hasten recovery is to build houses in a more uh, resilient way. And I think that's the way that after disaster is moving forward, communities are really going to prepare. So let me ask on that. You know, I was struck when uh, Bjarke Ingels was talking last night about he went up to the screen and he said, they're building this great project on West 57th, and if you stand on this balcony, you get to see your neighbors um, in the rest of the skyscraper. And all I think to myself is, Jesus, that sounds like hell. The whole reason I moved to New York is not to see my neighbors, right? Like, we move to these big cities because not because it offers us some great intimate back home experience. We move to cities because we like to be anonymous and, you know, find people on Tinder to meet for 12 minutes. Or, or 12 24, depending good. on your stamina. The, the <laughs> So let me ask you this. I mean, if we're talking about cities, if we're talking about places where people move, in part because they're, they're looking for very transient communities or they're looking to build communities that might not be geographically based, how do we make a case to them so that we don't have to look for post-traumatic growth? What, does, what do si the leaders of large cities in this room, what do they need to do right now to make a realistic argument to people about what they should do before the trauma comes yeah. so that they're resilient afterwards. So President Clinton talks about a notion that you can't unknow the truth. So it strikes me that, and, and this is our theory of change in terms of pre-disaster resilience, is we've got to educate people not in a hyperbolic way, but in a clear way showing what the future risks are, and then create a clear path towards further resilience. And I think one thing that we have to do is um, abolish this notion that resilience, and I'll bundle in energy efficiency because I think they're pretty tied together, and affordability are pitted against each other in a zero-sum battle, right? It's very, as, as um, the architect said last night, it's really easy to build uh, a tremendously interesting building for a lot of money. It's hard to build a functional, very interesting building uh, without less money. And I think that's where the challenge has to be today, changing the mindset that these two things are, are exclusive of each other. There, there's a theory, you never let a good crisis go to waste. And there's also a theory that where there's no struggle, where there's uh, no struggle, there is no progress. So we've got to create a dynamic where there's willingness to be some struggling, to fail, to be creative, a sense of urgency that will make resiliency more affordable. Charles, I think resilience also, it might have been you who last night said that, that resilience is seeing opportunity in the face of almost insurmountable challenges. That one of the qualities of communal resilience is having community to begin with and having a sense of people belonging to a place and having a stake in it to begin with. Um, and if you, don't, if you don't see your neighbors and if you're 
averse to talking to them or meeting them, um, that's, that's a strike against, against that powerful energizing force. I, I'll, I'll never forget about six days after Katrina, I came back to my neighborhood and the water was just on the edges of it. It had receded a little bit. And this guy down the block yells at me, somebody I'd never seen before. Um, and he just wanted to tell me that he was there a block away and wanted to have contact with another human being <laughs> who lived in roughly the same neighborhood. And that scene must have repeated itself thousands of times around the city in the coming weeks. Let me ask you, when you guys did your project and you went to other cities that had seen traumas, I, I know that you, there, was, there were successes and there were less, lesser successes. Besides the sense of community, did you find other distinguishing characteristics, other lessons that we should take from history and, not, and, and see Katrina as part of a continuum? Thoughtfulness in rebuilding, um, actually going through the messy process of listening to people, um, to people's desires and aspirations for their neighborhood and, um, and their city, which may be quite at odds with the dreamy um, city planning visions. Hmm. Um, there, were, there were a lot of those kinds of meetings and clashes in New Orleans. Um, and, and, and in the end, the, the people won out, as they usually do. And, and the, the, to that point, the, um, uh, Frederick Schwartz, who was selected to, uh, to plan about one-third of the city after, after Katrina, th this is what he said at, at the time. He said, the planning of cities in the face of disaster, natural and political, must reach beyond the Band-Aid of short-term recovery. It's, this, it's an opportunity to reassert the values of environmental care and social justice, of community building, and especially of helping the poor with programs of quality, affordable, and sustainable housing. That taking advantage of it, not letting a, a crisis go to waste. It's 10 years later, has that, has that promise been seized? I mean, if we went, if we, can we look to New Orleans as a model of using a crisis as actually making different choices? Absolutely. I mean, so let's, let's look at the school system in New Orleans. It is getting better. I put the gains in the New Orleans school system against any other similar school system across the country, and it's only getting better. Senator Mary Landrieu, after three terms in the Senate, is taking this on as her singular issue to make New Louisiana, in fact, um, one of the top educational states in the country. It's a wonderful community for businesses right now. In the residential recovery, we have a ways to go. There are some folks doing the right things, but they're... We're not there yet. I think what the rest of the country can learn is that unless we do things differently, we'll get the same result as we have in New Orleans. If you look at New York, this is the financial capital of at least America, if not the globe. At best, one fourth of the people who, at best, heading into the third anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, at best, one third or one fourth of the folks who would qualify for federal help have received that help. This is a disgrace, and so I think we can't look at New Orleans as an aberration. This is the track that the rest of the country is on unless we learn to have a different model of post-disaster recovery. And I'll tell you what that model has to do is set clear benchmarks for um, outcomes. How many houses will be built by when? Right now, we think that the model of post-disaster recovery in America measures the wrong thing measures fidelity to process. And if you achieve what you measure, you'll get the process, but you don't get the results. So what I think we have to learn from Louisiana is with all the wonderful full things we have going on, the residential recovery notion has to change, and we have to me measure what matters, which is building resilient homes and setting benchmarks for how many houses by when. L let me ask a, a question of the audience. How many of you live in cities that you believe sometime in the next, say, 10 or 20 years, that your city will experience some type of disaster like Sandy, like Katrina, perhaps smaller in scale, but something that's going to displace tens of thousands of people. Th how many? So it's quite a few. And so let me ask you, th let me ask this, and, and please feel free to email them into Q at, at NY Times, all us, our guests. What, what do you want to, if you're living in a city that you know is, uh, is gonna have this terrible thing, what do you feel like is not happening? What's the piece of information that you're missing or that you think your leaders are missing that's going to prepare your city for this disaster that comes through? And, and let me ask you gentlemen, I mean, 
It, Jim, it, when we were talking on the telephone, one thing that was interesting is that um, I was kind of doom and gloom. And in fact, I got a comment here um, from uh, Ananth, whose last name I won't pr be able to pronounce. It says, Charles, you should be less pessimistic. The future is bright for American cities. But fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. I, I think the question, and, and Jim, when we were talking, I was kind of doom and gloom, and you were saying, look, you know, it's not as bad as you make it out to be. New Orleans is doing okay. There's, there's a lot of homes that have come back. We, what is the thing that you think, if you could talk to Mayor de Blasio, if you could talk to um, uh, Mayor Lee in San Francisco, what, I what is the thing that's not being done right now that makes us believe that the future is bright, that there isn't this, um, we shouldn't be looking around our, over our shoulder for the next disaster. Well, I, I, I didn't want to give you the impression that I'm, I'm this, uh, neither a Cassandra nor uh, somebody who, who um, is, is naively optimistic about, about the future of a city. Um, I mean, in the case of, of, of a place like Louisiana and New Orleans, the, one of the essential ingredients is the political will to provide something as basic as flood protection. But that's, it's expensive. I mean, as, as we've said, somewhere between 40 and $60 billion was poured into New Orleans and 15 of that approximately was for flood protection. I wonder um, who in this audience thinks that Congress would muster up the will to do that in 2015. Um, 10 years ago, it was just barely possible and, and, and Mary Landrieu and David Vitter were laughed out of the room when they when they initially said what it would take. Um, so that, that's, I think, a basic ingredient that our leaders need to articulate. Um, we, we had a, a series about four years before Katrina in the paper, I think I was telling you about it the other day, and it predicted almost exactly the storm that befell us in, in 2005, and it had a big double truck in the newspaper that in graphic detail showed the areas of the city that would be under 10, 15 feet of water. Um, and it made an impression, and then two weeks later, it was, it was just a paper that had appeared. Wrapping fish? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, a lot of it's, so we can't wish away the disasters. They are going to happen. We, we know this, and they're probably going to happen more frequently and bigger than we think. A lot of the answer relates to what Rockefeller Foundation is doing and their infrastructure issues. We can do two things. We can either move inland, and I think 80% of the population lives either on a coast or on a floodable body of water. So I don't know if we can all run from that and be in Iowa. Or we can use, we, we can see ourselves as a bonded country and invest in the future by addressing these infrastructure issues that will make our country more resilient. So, so let me ask, you, let, let me take a couple of questions. Um, Bob Knight had sent in this question. Um, in New York, we tend to scoff at Southern politicians and social issues. Um, so you guys are now representing the entire South. I hope you're comfortable with that. We don't hear much about how they govern economically. Um, what has Bobby Jindal's role been in the revitalization of New Orleans? Of course, Mr. Jindal is now, has he declared for president? Is he? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, okay, okay. So, so um, I, I, Jim, you represent a newspaper. You might be a little bit constrained in, how, in, in what you can say, but we'll consider this um, completely on the record, so everything you say will be on, on the <laughs> website. <laughs> Let's start with you. <laughs> Uh, th there's nothing I could say that uh, our editorial board, of which I'm a member, hasn't already said. <laughs> well, uh, what's the question? So Bobby Jin, so Bobby, so so the, polit the political leadership, particularly your, your your current governor who's running for president, what what should we should we credit him with the rebuilding of New Orleans? Should we not credit him with that? Is that a win for him? Uh, n uh, well, he he was not. <laughs> He, he was not governor in 2005, so I guess that answers the question pretty quickly. Um, he, he, uh, in subsequent so. hurricanes, he has been a, a, a very um, savvy, wonkish marshaller of forces with great detail at his command in press conferences. Um, <laughs> he's, uh, he's been running for president for a good long while, and it's been, uh, it's been many months since governance of Louisiana was in the forefront of his mind. Zach, I, th I think you have some, some, uh, some strong opinions on this. So let's talk about what's working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think we can look at the leadership that Mayor Landrieu has brought to the city of New Orleans by professionalizing city government, setting very clear benchmarks, and running efficient yet responsive government. God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so one more question. Uh, l- let me just find, find the right one here. So, so in terms of what is not being done, what is not happening in New Orleans right now, uh, Nasli um, uh, asked, we still think of resiliency as a reactive product to disasters, and we always find the money to fix fe- f- via FEMA to fix the disaster versus proactively investing in infrastructure to avoid the massive costs post-disaster. In New Orleans, and then we'll talk broadly about the nation, what is not being done right now on a, on a wide scale level, beyond just sort of home by home. Jim, you mentioned that you can now see um, the ocean from your 30th, 33rd floor that you couldn't see previously and that you weren't certain if your kids That's were a bit there. hyperbolic if I said that. <laughs> um, but you can see the water that's in our backyard. And, a- and what's not being done is anything really concerted about the fact that we're, we're sinking. Uh, we're ab- about 9.2 millimeters per year, which is you know, that much. But it, you know, multiply that, and by 2050, you have whole areas of coastal Louisiana, well, they're already disappeared in many ways, and the map of the continental United States that we all look at has very little to do with the reality of what Louisiana looks like. So uh, to do something, and Louisiana thinks it'll be able to spend about $500 million a year beginning in 2017 on coastal erosion and coastal uh, subsidence, um, which are the two factors, but that's not enough. Um, so that's uh, what my kids will will uh, inherit in the way of a city. It may be, you know, it may be much more Venetian, hmm. um, and uh, it's not equipped yet for that. Um, I think Zach is absolutely right about the good things that are being done in education. Um, public safety is still a major concern in in New Orleans as it is in many big old cities in the U.S., um, and I, I haven't seen the solution yet. Um, and narrowing the education gap. It's not something that's yet happened. Z- Zach, you guys are now working outside of New Orleans. You're working in, in New Jersey, in New York, I believe in um, Joplin also. What are you seeing, what are we not doing nationally that, that we should be doing that's a realistic, a realistic stretch? So, so one thing I think is adopting building codes that are consistent with resilient building practices, both for rehabs and for new builds. And there's a code out there um, put forth by IBHS uh, called the Fortified Standard. Immediately, and folks can go to IBHS's website and look at two houses, one um, built according to IBHS, the standard and the other just normal building codes, and one blows down with a giant wind and the other looks wonderful. So we've gotta get realistic, I think, about our building codes in America. Uh, Two, we've we've gotta focus on small and mid-sized businesses. in areas of major disasters, Joplin, Missouri, and that's an interesting case study um, accepted, 40% of successful businesses, businesses that were making profit, don't reopen after disaster. Hmm. So we've got to educate business owners and give them practical steps that they can take to make sure that they're more resilient. Those are a couple ways. They've got to get the right insurance. After Sandy, I spoke with 20 or 30 business owners who were either greatly reduced or out of business, and they all would have had the right insurance, they just didn't understand it. That's why I really applaud what Zurich is doing, building this curriculum to make sure that small and mid-sized businesses understand and mitigate risk. Mm. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your time. Thank you, audience, and uh, it's a great conversation. Hopefully 10 years in the world.